Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to season three of the Agile World, where we discuss customer and employee experience, organizational and workforce transformation, and how business can adapt and continually improve in an Agile age. The Agile World podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed in this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile World podcast. Welcome to a special episode of the show brought to you in partnership with Arlington Economic Development, where we discuss issues related to the workforce, the role of place in the future of work, and the role of the creative sector in a larger business context. We call this return on creativity. You can learn more about Return on Creativity and register for our upcoming events at www.returnoncreativity.com. Today we have an excerpt from our July 13 event, Return on Creativity, Return to Work, featuring a panel with David Cornbricks of Savills, North America, Steve Blair from Lyceum Insurance Services, Jessica Simpson from Alchemy Talent Consulting, and moderated by Susan Sirocco of Arlington Economic Development. I hope you enjoy. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and lead us off. Uh, this, this last panel um, is really intended to sort of wrap up and pull together a lot of the conversations that we've been having today because it, it really is going to be an important next feature to what, the, what work life looks like, which is taking all these different approaches to return to the office. Sure. So uh, I'm David Cornbrooks. Um, really excited to be here. I'm a proud Arlington resident. Um, I work for Savills. Savills is a global real estate firm. And in the U.S., we are focused exclusively on advising tenants on their occupancy strategies. So Nick Gregorius from an earlier panel is on the landlord side. We are on the tenant side. Um, I work for companies across all industries um, in the region and in Arlington, uh, companies in the tech sector, associations, nonprofits, public sector clients, including uh, Arlington Economic Development. Um, and I, our business has really uh, evolved, I think, from being you know, brokerage led to being more consulting led um, as real estate decisions have become just more complicated over the last couple of years and especially over the last uh, 17 months. And because of that, we have um, experts in workplace, workforce, GIS mapping, project management, capital markets, um, all to help uh, tenants make what are, what are now complicated decisions. As you might expect, you know, every single conversation we've had uh, recently has been around the two challenges that every organization is facing right now that we've talked about um, throughout these panels is, you know, what does a return to the office look like? And then how the last 16 months, uh, how that impact the future workspace going forward. Um, our office um, in, in the DC region has been open um, on a voluntary basis since last June. Um, you know, we're talking to, to tenants about what the return looks like and we wanted to lead the way in that regard. Um, and then as of yesterday, um, across the U.S., we are back uh, basically full time in the office with, with a couple of exceptions. We had our, our first happy hour in person uh, last night, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun to see some faces that we hadn't seen in person. In a while. Stephen, tell us about you. Hi, my name is Stephen Blair, and I'm the president of Lyceum Insurance Services. And we were talking earlier on one of the panels about technology issues, and I just lost my light. So <laughs> you said this was going to be entertaining, Susan. So I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, we support businesses in the Mid Atlantic region. Um, and after kind of post pandemic here, we've been supporting employees all over the world. Uh, our business helps businesses manage their employee benefit programs. We have strategic HR programs, as well as helping businesses with their uh, risk management solutions. We're currently 100% um, working from home for our entire team. We uh, were hybrid before, especially in the summers, I used to allow my employees to work from home on Friday or on Fridays. And um, potentially some Thursdays, and now we're 100% focused. And, you know, we're pretty fortunate because I had a hybrid workforce before, you know, we had made a lot of the technology and security um, protocols, put all of those into place. 
so that when the pandemic came for us, it was just another day. We were just working exclusively from home and continuing to be able to support our clients. Um, I feel like we're a 50 year old startup company because of all of the changes that has happened with the way that we're supporting our clients and their employees. Um, before we used to have a workforce as everyone's been talking about that was focused in the Mid-Atlantic region, especially for our clients in the Northern Virginia Arlington area. Uh, people were living and working in a physical location here and it was like almost overnight you know, people started moving and migrating across the country and that created a lot of challenges for certain organizations. And so we've had to adapt and help our clients adapt through that process. And it's been really interesting to, to see that, that happen over time. Well, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your insights and your uh, summary there. Jessica, set me straight. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jess Simpson, and I'm uh, the founder of Alchemy Talent Consulting. We are a small consulting and coaching group that primarily works with uh, late stage funding um, high growth companies. We help them strengthen their culture so that they can successfully scale the business. And I also run a community for called 10K Collective. It's for mid-career women of color who've gotten promoted to a point of isolation in their careers. And um, we provide community workshops and cohort programs that enable them to be seen and heard, valued and validated, um, which is often something that uh, is challenging in the places that they work. Probably even more so during the pandemic, thank you. Um, so, you know, this panel was really uh, pulled, put together to try to kind of get sort of the, the cap on the, on the day of what do the different approaches to work really look like? I mean, we've talked about, you know, the hybrid, the telework and, you know, the, the fully remote and the fully in place. But I'm hearing that there's something in between that has kind of been a bit of a thread throughout all of these panels today. And Jessica, maybe you could start us off and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what is the role of physical space now? And, you know, how is that impacting? I think mostly I'm curious about the 10K Collective, but, you know, maybe your, maybe your other work and your other clients provide a little bit more of a little um, viewpoint, a little glimpse into how they're really looking more now at what the difference between the physical space and working non-physically looks like? Yeah, so um, I work primarily in the Bay Area and the Pacific Northwest. Um, so I'll, I'll put that out there because um, that I think influences the way that the clients I work with are handling this situation. Um, most of them have surveyed their employees in the last couple of months and have discovered that there's a lot that their employees have enjoyed about working remotely. And I think also with um, Bay Area traffic, not having to deal with that commute in heavy traffic um, has been beneficial. So what I'm finding is that they're looking at their, um, how they want to utilize their physical space going forward. Some have already um, leased it out. Others are uh, sharing that space with other organizations and most of the companies that I work with are using the physical space as a gathering spot for company events at regular intervals to bring the team together for um, retreats and, uh, and specific scheduled events. But, um, and it's, it's uh, if they've kept space, it's available to employees when they want to access it, um, but they're going with a, a remote first model primarily in, in this geographic area. I think you were the first person in, today who's actually used the word traffic uh, as, as one of the elements that ha has got to be influencing a lot of people uh, in, their, in their comfort level of why working remotely actually may have um, a, a high degree of benefit um, is not having to deal with traffic. Um, so thank you for that. Stephen, uh, you, uh, you know, you've said some interesting things, even when we were in our um, 
introductory session trying to get a, a little bit of a better insight into what you, you, you do around the risk uh, management piece. And I was struck by one of the things that you've talked about, which was um, security. I know I think that you had mentioned that you have some law firms as uh, clients. And of course, technology, which you've just demonstrated is, is uh, <laughs> an ongoing um, unreliable partner <laughs> for us, because I think technology now really is uh, as much of a collaborative partner as anything. But tell us a little bit more about how the risk factors are actually um, impacting. I think you actually talked about the demographics of um, insuring people from a health standpoint. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, one of the big things that, that we're concerned about, especially with remote work, is that folks are um, maybe not working in a secure fashion. You know, I think about my own team, we deal with a lot of HIPAA data. Um, if you're a professional services, you have you know, all of your client data, but really anybody in the company could be a potential um, leakage point um, when it comes to security, specifically cybersecurity, you know, and it's one of the big things that we're talking to our clients about is to make sure that number one, employees are working 100% on employer equipment. You know, we have our personal pads and our phones and everything like that. But if we're in our home and we're connected directly to the internet, that's an access point for somebody to be able to come in and compromise our business. So one of the things that's important is people are working remotely is that they're using things like VPNs and other type of secure systems to be able to, to um, connect and work effectively through the business um, and not use things like your personal pad that's you know, connected to you know, your, your home internet service that could potentially be a point of, of entry for um, somebody that's illicit like a hacker. Um, but there's other hazards, you know, with people working from home. Do you require that your employees have a data dedicated workspace? Um, from a workers' comp standpoint, people are classified, you know, either as working at home or hybrid or working in the office. Have you updated that? And if somebody doesn't have a dedicated workspace in the home that you've approved, um, you know, and, and they're working and they burn themselves in the kitchen while they decide to start cooking dinner early during business hours, are you potentially in a position where you could have a worker's comp claim? Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting how we've been working with our clients to help develop work from home strategies, um, ways to approve workspace, um, and how we can help our clients then be able to protect themselves from a liability standpoint. And we have a lot of people in the industry are talking about extra liability insurance for managers to be able to protect them against potential losses that happen while people are working from home. Well, if you're if you're taking a meeting when you're in a car, <laughs> you know, you, I think that's that, a liability. You know, well, I, it sounds to me like you know, there's there's got to be some happy medium between really um, leveraging the extent of flexibility that people have from, de from devices, from communications devices, sure. to um, being able to use them within certain boundaries, I suspect. Uh, but I guess one of those would have to be that the car would have to be parked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if somebody gets into an accident while they're driving and working, you know, and on that call, that's absolutely a potential liability for the organization. So as we're working with our employees and we can't control what they're doing because they're not in our physical space like they were before, you know, are we setting up and having our employees work in a safe work environment um, that's been approved um, in working with our carriers that help protect our organizations, you know, against these potential liabilities that could happen. Wow, that's that's a lot to have to. That's like an extra layer of it what is. employers and employees are thinking about. Yeah. And that's why I'm like, you know, it's really become like business has changed. I mean, we've always had people that were teleworking, and some organizations had this hybrid model, like we enjoyed ourselves. But have you put enough total thought process around what your potential liabilities could be as an organization? And that's where it's valuable for somebody to work with a, a professional risk management uh, company that can help 
you know, maneuver that way through and work with the insurance companies to make sure one, that the work is defined, two, the workspace is defined, the hours are defined for work, um, and that we have safety, safety protocols in place like you would have in your office, but also within the home as people are working you know, through their, their work day and in that secure environment. So um, I'm gonna over to you, David. Um, you know, this, this is a lot to pull together in, uh, in, in how you are coaching your clients about what their workspace should look like. Because if there are liability issues, we heard from a panelist the, um, earlier today from Arlington Community Federal Credit Union who said that one of the things that uh, their staff are having to really do is study employment law. I mean, not to the not to the point of of getting a degree, but becoming much more familiar with the nuances of employment law and assessing, um, you know, work. Um, what did she call it? She called it um, productivity assessments. So how does that fit into your work, David, or does it? Um, it, it does to some extent. We're not uh, lawyers. We don't provide legal advice. We're not accountants. We don't provide tax advice. But all of those are clearly intertwined with, um, you know, your remote strategy going forward, where you recruit from, where you let employees to move from or not, you know, allow them to maintain where they are if they've moved um, via COVID. So, you know, all, all these are um, tangentially related and part of just the overall more complicated, I think, decision framework that um, organizations are having to, you know, make decisions under. Um, these are just, they're a lot more complicated. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of leaders are, are seeing the role of the office as a way to create the, you know, facilitate the social connection, the human interaction, promote collaboration, these impromptu interactions, you know, build and promote the culture and community, um, you know, and communicate the brand and mission, but um, there's a whole host of other, um, you know, considerations, including what you mentioned before, what Steve was talking about, um, that play into sort of the overall decision-making. You know, the physical office is just, you know, one tool that organizations have to help employees do good work. Um, you know, technology policies, benefits being sort of the other. So they're all, you know, intertwined in a way. Absolutely. Um, Jessica, you know, I, I'm curious about how um, businesses are kind of looking at staying competitive. I mean, if, if a lot of your clients are doing a combination of remote and they're looking at their talent pool being from um, a wide range of, of geographic areas, and they may not be quite so concerned with the physical space, but they may be having to be still be concerned with the, how to be competitive with benefits and compensation and other perks when they can hire people from anywhere. How are they, how are they packaging all those things? We heard from someone in a, in a pre previous panel about um, how many times people need to be interviewed to make sure that they're a good fit. But I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of um, those considerations about what that the work environment goes beyond uh, the colleagues and goes to some of the more practical things like compensation and benefits and perks. What are you What are you hearing about, and what are you? How are you advising your clients on that? Yeah, one of the things I do see clients, um, particularly the ones who've gone with a remote first approach. Um, is that they are now considering whether or not they have to hire exclusively from their local geography or whether or not mm -hmm. the entire US or North America and beyond even now open up in terms of a talent pool, which certainly does complicate what they do from a compensation and benefits perspective. Um, for example, I had a conversation recently with a client that's looking at whether or not they need to implement geographic differentials in the major metro areas where they now operate, what that means um, 
if they're uh, bringing in talent um, or, or hiring talent from um, within North America, but outside of the US. And I think for a lot of them, because it's still early on, they're having to figure out <laughs> philosophically and mm -hmm. financially how they want to tackle that. Um, from, a, from a competitiveness perspective, though, back to your question, what I'm finding is that part of the um, part of what enables them to be competitive is the flexibility they can now mm -hmm. offer that perhaps they didn't before and that um, they can accommodate uh, um, a, a wider range of needs in the employee population from a schedule and location mm -hmm. perspective. So it seems to be opening up an entirely new candidate pool that perhaps they wouldn't have had access to previously. Um, and it also, you know, again, just uh, that I'm, I'm primarily focused in the Bay Area and also do a bit of a bit of work in New York, which are, you know, historically two of the most expensive places to live in the country. Um, you know, what that's also doing for companies is even, you know, maintaining their current compensation levels. If they're, they're used to paying, you know, New York salaries or Bay Area salaries, but they're now hiring all across the U.S., their compensation package is exponentially more competitive in other parts of the country than it perhaps is in those cities, even without them elevating uh, pay at all. So that also seems to be um, working in their favor when it comes to competitiveness. I think I um, how it this... works in the favor of the employees who <laughs> recognize that their um, peers are making as much money as they are with a lower cost of living. And would they get compensated and paid to travel to an in-person um, event? Lots of different, lots of questions, I think that, um, and if, if any of our other prior panelists uh, have indicated, it's kind of an employer employee marketplace um, because there are many more job openings than there are um, employees potentially. So Stephen, you started to say something. Yeah, your first keynote speaker today actually said, you know, if a Picasso has the same value, whether it's hanging in New York or in, in rural West Virginia or whatever state he happens yeah, to be. Yeah, he said a barn, I think. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, and, and we're seeing that, especially on the employee benefits side. Um, what we tend to find is in, in this Washington, D.C. metro area, our benefit packages tend to be much richer than those in other places around the country, even so far as the type of benefits that are available from the carriers in this state, in Northern Virginia in particular, um, are much richer than, and, and in many ways, I think it's because of our closeness to the federal government, than say the plans that are available for employers in Florida or some other places around the country. Um, and that's one of the big things that we had to shift was, especially if you had employees living and working and you had plans, employee benefit plans that were built around a regional marketplace and then we all of a sudden overnight had this migration happening you know for a lot of our clients we had to make a shift mid-year to be able to accommodate people moving um, but also to go back when you're talking about evaluating compensation and benefit packages and everything like that especially as we're starting to move into fourth quarter and do our year-end planning because a lot of people are renewing kind of that fourth quarter into the a jan one effective date um, you know, we're looking at that, but when we're benchmarking now, we're not necessarily benchmarking locally um, and within a certain demographic in terms of employer group, um, but now we're potentially competing with employers all over the country in a variety of different mm -hmm. fields. And now the question is, and what the theory is that we should be benchmarking across all fields as opposed to a very mm -hmm. specific field because we may be looking at and attracting employees, um, maybe coming from different industries that could still fit and work within um, what we do here locally. And uh, some employers are having trouble thinking about that, um, but all the experts are saying that we need to be looking more broadly in terms of benchmarking, both on salary and benefits compensation, as opposed to really getting you know minute within our specific field and um, job type. That, that sounds like a job all in itself. <laughs> it is. As I said, 50 years startup. <laughs> <laughs> 50 years startup. 
Well, we are, we, this has been a great conversation. I know we are, are coming to the end um, of our time. I'd love to hear from you, start with you, David, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll just go across is your, you know, your kind of recap uh, thoughts about what folks, you know, how is, how is Arlington really showing up? It's a question I've been asking all the panels that I've been in is, you know, we, we want Arlington to be the place that people, you know, from an AED standpoint, which attracts businesses and retains them and has the talent to back it up. So how does that fit in with your work and what are your, what are your final thoughts to leave with our audience today? Um, you know, I think I want to address sort of the Arlington specific uh, question. I think Arlington is going to be really well positioned uh, for the future. I believe that both as a resident um, and as someone who does a lot of work in Arlington, you, know, you have a lot of a lot of people who live there and a lot of businesses that locate there because it is an environment where you can work, you can live, you can play. There's amazing restaurants. Um, it's dynamic. It's close to Washington D.C., where a lot clearly happens, and it, but you can also get further west to attract talent that's out there. Um, so I, I think, you know, and then not to mention you have an, an enormous uh, force that is already here and coming in in uh, in in a bigger way in Amazon. Um, it's only going to sort of enhance all of those things. So I, I, I think Arlington is very well positioned for the future. Um, and I think just more generally in closing. You know, these are these are really complicated decisions. Um, there is no one size fits all, and I think, you know, the, the labor, the tight labor market is really driving a lot of these decisions, and we're seeing a little bit of a conflict in, you know, what employees really want versus what, um, you know, leadership is thinking they need to, um, you know, advance the organization. And so, you know, how we advise clients is, you know, communicate very clearly and very often. Um, and, you know, flexibility, I think, has been sort of the theme uh, throughout the entire, you know, pandemic and then clearly today throughout um, all of the panels, um, but to be flexible because I think no one really knows what the next 12 or 18 months is going to be. And I think organizations and employees um, are going to have to kind of remain flexible to see how things play out. Thank you. Stephen, uh, yes, what would you like the audience to be left with? A, a, a nugget? Well, I mean, in, in terms of talking about Arlington in particular, as somebody that, that works there quite often, several times a week pre-COVID, I was there and we're in the process of potentially opening an office in Arlington. Um, one of the big things that I've noticed over the past two or three years is a big shift of movement. We've had a number of clients leave the Washington DC marketplace, so downtown, mm -hmm. and actually move to Northern Virginia. They and, and what we've been told is you know, it's it. Um, there's there seems to be or appears to be a better work life type um, uh, work life type balance that seems to be a little bit better better in the Arlington market in terms of the type of office spaces that's available in conjunction with the types of affordable housing that's available in conjunction with work. So people mm -hmm. maybe aren't having to travel so far in. Um, and the other little nugget I want to put out kind of more globally is that, you know, as people are reviewing their year end and making decisions is really to take a hard look at your employee benefit programs and protect your business from potential liabilities. Speak to somebody that's licensed to be able to give you firm advice that has a good reputation um, and protect your business and your employees while we're trying to still figure out this combination of in, uh, permanent work in a space versus hybrid versus 100% remote. Thank you. That that really says a lot. Uh, and, I, and it sounds to me as though actually a lot of the components around your work and risk management are, are not something that wind up being priorities for a lot of companies, but yet wind up being one of the things that they should value uh, a lot. Uh, it's where along it can get way. you into trouble, for sure. Yes, <laughs> get you into trouble. And big Jessica, trouble. Yes. Uh, Jessica, thank you for all of your really good insights. I'm sure that there's been so, some things that you've learned along the way, particularly in this last year, that could apply to Arlington. I mean, I know that you typically work on the West Coast or in New York, but you know, we've got a, we've got our fair share of high growth company, companies here. 
what should we be on the lookout for? What should they be really paying attention to that they can learn from um, some of the kinds of folks that you've worked with? Well, I think, um, you know, to second what both David and Stephen spoke about is that, um, you know, we don't know what we don't know <laughs> right now. And so I think we're all in this in a, a startup mindset in a lot of ways, and we're learning and growing and evolving. And so um, I think employers everywhere can benefit from um, having feedback loops set up with their employees, um, surveying them, being in regular transparent dialogue with them around what the future of work looks like uh, wherever they're at. And one of the things I'm really curious to see is, um, you know, culture has historically been such an important part of the conversation, why we go to work certain places, it's been part of how companies compete. And I'm really curious to see what the role of culture is going to be moving forward in organizations that are choosing more of a hybrid model or even a remote first model. Just really curious to see um, if we still think about the cult, if we still think about the role that culture plays in the employee experience mm -hmm. the same way five years from now, if culture and this sounds um, this is might sound unusual coming from a people and culture person, but if um, you know we trade some other things or prioritize some other things over culture moving forward, because when folks are remote first, um, it doesn't have the same. Uh, priority in the employee's eyes that it does when they're in an office environment five days a week. Um, so that's not necessarily a, a prediction. It's more just a curiosity that I, that I have around how the role of culture in companies is going to evolve in a um, predominantly in, in remote first environments moving forward. You know, you've said something really important because throughout a number of our panel conversations, there have been comments about the importance of communication. I think all three of you have, have had some level of that in, in your comments. And Edie Goldberg in one of our prior panels did say, because she does organizational psychology and she said, you know, the complement to having robust communications is listening. And so I think that you know, that's, that's the other side of making sure that you know where your employees' heads are at and, you know, what's important to them. So setting those priorities is, is likely to um, show up, I think, in that regard. Thanks again for listening to the Agile World Podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, from my website at theagile.world.